the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice for He has made me glad. His love is gifts with us giving in my heart, I will answer His call with praise. I will say this the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for Must be seated for prayer. Dear God, our loving Father, we declare this morning that as we enter your gates, we are coming with thanksgiving in our hearts. As we enter your courts, Lord, we are coming with praise. And so we honor and glorify your holy name, asking that God you receive all the glory, honor, power, majesty, and dominion. It is all yours. This morning, Lord, as we come to hear from you, we ask that God, you use your servant, our doctorate, to bring forth your word with power. Lord, we pray that there will be conviction. That even, Lord God Almighty, as you take us through this journey of our commitment to serve you in the next three years in this general assembly, our prayer, O oh God, is that this morning will bring great energy to us, even as we wait on you. So we pray that, God, you guide us through this morning devotion and this Bible study and this exposition, even as it guides us for the sake of of this very day. We honor your name, O oh God, our prayer of faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have passed against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Banasifiwe, hallelujah. We are blessed this morning again to have an opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus, that you can listen to him through his servant, Dr. Kelvin. Like I said yesterday, Dr. Kelvin Morithi is head of department, practical theology at Post University. But before you went there, Dr. Kevin was our youth pastor in PCEA Roresho. And therefore, he has, he's a youth, but also has great passion for young people. And we have said that we will continue to say the message of God to this church and to the nation this time about the youth and what they can be able to do. And therefore, without taking much time, we can appreciate the Lord for giving us one of our own. Dr. Kevin Morithi, come over and take us through today's session. Bwana Yesu Asifiwe, the Lord be praised again uh, this morning. I'm happy to be with you on this second day as we move forward, as we look at the text and we reflect about service. I am looking at our faces and I can see a mixture uh, of emotions. Uh, on one hand, I know we have very fresh in our memories our late Reverend, very Reverend Dr. George Anjao, our father in the faith, who has left us. But as I was speaking with uh, Reverend Mbai, he was telling me it is a reason still to be joyful as we reflect on a servant who has served with dignity, a servant who has served with excellence, as Joshua says, a servant who has served in sincerity and in faithfulness. 
Even during this time, I thought that this provides for us a good context as we focus on today's topic. Do we remember the first question that we had yesterday? What was it? Who are we really serving? And we said that in the challenges of serving rival gods, God is calling us to serve the one true and living God. For this second day, brothers and sisters, I'd like to share with us a second question. Who are you serving with? Who are you serving with? Lord, we once again are turning to you and to your word, which is life, your word, which is truth. Sanctify us with your word because your word is truth. A prayer of faith through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. First Timothy 5.17 tells us, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. This obviously is a message from Paul uh, to Timothy, his mentee, and to me it was speaking to us in our situation as a church to honor those among us who labor in preaching and in teaching. Uh, of course, this is a passage where people have gone to give us our understanding of the two offices of elders, ruling and teaching elders, and the very Reverend Dr. George Wanjao deserves high honor for his service. As a small boy here in this church where I grew up, I have fond memories of his smile, his voice, and presence. But there are two specific special memories that come to mind this morning that I think speak to the question that we are asking, who are you serving with? This very hall that we are gathered in, I, I gather from, from an elder who serves here, this church was actually a vision of our father in the faith. Uh, in those years, the youth used to gather down there uh, in the McLeven Hall. I recall those days because I was among them. Uh, and because the ministry was growing and the youth were uh, almost bursting out of the, of the small uh, sanctuary, uh, this father in faith had this great vision. Uh, I also gather that other people had different uh, views on whether the building should be built or not, as you will know in the challenges of leadership. Yet here we are, this man of faith, who has served with distinction across generations, we are able to gather in this hall that he saw a vision for. And when we are not gathering here for the GA, by the way, this is where the youth gather every Sunday to hear the word of God. To me, this is serving with the youth in mind. But there's a second memory um, that I have heard. This one I heard from my father who, as I mentioned, uh, has served as an elder in this church. He tells me that he once was near his office and could hear uh, this father of faith crying to God uh, for young people in this church to get married. And of course, we know Africans and marriage, we have a very close relationship. Uh, but, but this was his desire. Again, to me, this is the kind of service we are speaking about when we say we are called to serve in sincerity and in faithfulness. You can imagine here, a parish minister spending time crying to God for young people to get married, to, to be able to get into a joyful, loving relationships in God. What is the assessment as we think about serving, who will we serve with? Among the many children that our father has fathered in the ministry is one of my own mentors in the ministry who is seated here this morning. And to me, this is what intergenerational ministry looks like. When we ask, who will we serve with, this is a call to remember that God's mission is a mission that he invites different generations to participate in. It is not a mission for one generation only. It is a mission for all the generations to participate in. And that is why Joshua says that, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more story. I recall again as a small boy going to our village home and my great grandparents whom I met would gather us together, my grandparents and their siblings, my parents and their siblings and my generation and our siblings 
and they would bring us together in their home to tell stories, to sing hymns, to offer, to offer prayers and to give thanks for God. What that has left in my heart as I recall those many, many years ago, the memories I recall, it has reminded me or it taught me that God is interested in every aspect of our lives. That a relationship with God is beyond a Sunday experience. It is an everyday thing. My, my grandparents, again, would do the same thing. And we would sit by the fireplace and tungechoma mahindi tukule pamoja tukiweza kusemezana wakitukumbusha kwamba mungu ndiye ambaye tunapaswa kulenga imani yetu kwake. That was a heritage I learned. And my father and mother, my father who has served here as an elder, when I was still young, took, me, took us to Nendeni mission areas when there would be mission trips. And I would say, because, before I studied theology, this was my theological school, the school of mission. I know my mother does not, would not have loved me to say this of her. Uh, she's one of those members in the church who sits at the back, never likes to be at the front. But there is a ministry that she's involved with called hospital ministry. This ministry goes to hospitals in the HDU and ICU and prays to patients. And again, many times, she would tag me along and take me there. And before I knew what pastoral care or practical theology was, here, here was I receiving this education for life. I am aware as, as I look at you this morning, I see here maybe great grandparents, perhaps grandparents. I am sure parents. I can see parish ministers, Sunday school teachers. Uh, I can see certain people in uh, maybe the youth committee or the youth group. Let me ask you a question as we reflect on our topic this morning. Do young people find a safe space <laughs> around you? Do young people find a safe space around you? <laughs> or do they see you and they take a as an, a perpendicular turn and run away <laughs> from you. Do young people find you as a safe space to discuss their issues, to ask those hard questions? Do they find you to be a safe space? Again, the moderator reminded us that as we invest in structures, we should invest in people. Again, another question, in your church leadership, are you investing in structures or are you investing in people? And especially, are you investing in our children and our young people? How so? Our passage in Joshua 24 is set, as I said yesterday, within the understanding that God is a God of covenant. What in our Presbyterian theology and ministry practice we refer to as covenant theology. God the God of promise or the God of covenant has promised to be God to us and to our children. And if you want to know the first youth worker, that is our God. <laughs> if you want to know the person who has been most passionate about ministry to young people, it is God. If we do not have that same passion and conviction for youth and children ministry, then we may not be serving our God. You take away covenant theology from the Bible and many of the things that we do every Sunday will lose meaning. Infant baptism. When we process with the word in front, we are saying that the word of God speaks to us both in its Old Testament and in the New Testament. Our sacraments, etc., etc. If you take away covenant theology, if you take away this principle that God is a God of the generations, we lose the opportunity for children and youth ministry. And I would say actually that we as Presbyterians have the motivation to actually do youth ministry because this is what we believe, that God is a God to us and to our children after us. While we see our children and young people as troublesome, God sees them as potential. When we are selfishly focused on our own generation, God is more concerned about how his mission will be propagated through the generations. Again, our DSG reminded us that this church has been founded by young people. And so when we lose sight of God's mission in and through the generations, we miss out on God's heart for the church of Jesus Christ 
and our role as the Presbyterian Church of East, East Africa to offer meaningful ministry in a continent that is young. Statisticians will tell us that there are some countries in this continent whose median age is 19 years old. 19 years old. And many times there has been a great migration uh, of young people to other, to other churches. Now, that of course presents some challenges for us in ministry. But I, 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 I want to present to us a different way to look at the reasons why young people would be leaving the church. One, young people are always on the move. They will move from our villages to the towns, to the cities, to go for education. Others will move there to go for work. So just the fact that they have left our parish does not mean that they have left the faith. In the period of uh, youth, minist youth, and youth is broad, 13 to 35 is our constitution, 13 to 18, to 9, 18 19 is adolescence or teenage, 19 to 35 is what some scholars are calling emerging adulthood, and emerging adulthood is that process whereby young people are going through a process of what we call individuation. They are asking, the faith that my great-grandparent taught me, the faith that my grandparent taught me, the faith that I have learned from my father and mother, is this my faith? Can I now say as an individual that I believe in Jesus Christ? And we all know the pressures and challenges that come across the lives of young people in this time. And so this is not the time to tell young people, Enda huko na maswaliza. Unaopenda kuliza maswali mingi. It is a time that as they are asking these questions, they have men and women walking al alongside them to help them answer the questions that they are asking. And so young people sometimes will move to other spaces that are more friendly to them because there they find people who are willing to lay down their lives for them. Number three, let us not lose the missional opportunity that we have in the Great Migration. Havi Kuyani, a Malawian theologian and missiologist, uh, the other day uh, in a conference I was participating in, spoke of Joel. You know Joel where he says that our young people will dream dreams and visions, our daughters and our sons. And he's saying actually that in this moment we are living in, there is quite a lot of movement. People are moving even to other countries in search for better opportunities. We know the sad state of affairs for those who are crossing the ocean uh, and they die on the way in search of better opportunities. But he was saying, these young people who move to other places, we could see them as missionaries. And we could see our time with them in the congregations as a time to invest, as a time to disciple, as a time to nurture, so that when they go, they go with the gospel and they go and do God's work in another place because that is God's mission. God's mission is not to remain in the four walls of the church, but is to touch every sphere of this world. And Habakkuk says it well, until the knowledge of God covers, the, is like the seas that the word of God will continue to go forth. So friends, a challenge here for us, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But here is the problem. We have afflicted generations in light of a distracted church. Two generations. We have the drinking generation. I had Honorable Gashagua mention this. The government is doing, or seems to be doing much more than churches. The church appears only to come at the place of burial. A whole generation is dying, leaving behind beautiful cathedrals and churches in the community and villages. And I'm asking myself, what can the church do? The aged generation becoming more and more neglected, feeling as if they have no value and sometimes only scattered initiatives of visiting homes every now and then. God is inviting us in this passage to be generational thinkers, to be generational ministers, to be generational elders, generational servants of Jesus Christ. Having in mind this reality that God is 
doing something big and something beautiful in his son, Jesus Christ. And this thing is not for us alone. It is for all the generations. So Joshua, we find him here in Joshua 24 with such confidence and such passion, such conviction. And I was wondering from a very fearful leader whom we find in Joshua 1 that God has to remind him, be strong and courageous. A number of times, this fearful leader, how does this fearful leader transition to be a confident leader who has discerned God's mission for the generations? How, will, how is this possible? And what can we learn from his life? I offer to us, brothers and sisters, three lessons and one warning. How are, we to, how are we to effectively engage young people? I offer us three lessons and one warning. The first, we are called to, and I will call this the A, B, C. The A, B, C. The three lessons. Assist, A, assist young people to understand the voice of God. Assist young people to understand, the other word I had there is to disarm, to disarm the voice of God. God commissions Joshua in numbers, reminds Moses that Moses, you have served me well, but your service will end at this point. And beyond that, I have called this young man called Joshua to lead and to lead God's people into the mission. And in Numbers 13, 16, Moses following God's command, but I wonder whether it was a sense of discernment that he had, he renames Joshua. So we, we see there in Numbers 13, 16 that Moses renames Joshua from Hosea, son of Nun, to Joshua. Now Hosea in the Hebrew means salvation. Joshua in the Hebrew is actually Yehoshua, which means Jehovah or Yahweh is salvation. And there is something interesting here. I think Moses wants Joshua to remember that in his service, it is clear that Joshua has an audience of one. That Joshua has not been called to entertain people, but he has been called to discern and to follow God. It is God who has called Joshua. And God is the God of salvation to Joshua. I think this was a reminder of who Joshua was really serving. Assist young people to discern the voice of God. To what extent, then, do our actions, do our priorities, do our ambitions as a church communicate that God is in charge. Another example in the Old Testament is that of Eli and Samuel. We know that story very well, and I will not belabor the point. But here you have this experienced servant of God, Eli, and you have the young boy Samuel. And we know that in this generation, God is about to usher in his word in a new way because the people had fallen, out, fallen far away from God. And Samuel hears this voice three times. He does not know who he, exactly it is who is speaking. And we have Eli, a wise man, who helps Samuel to discern the voice of God, to understand the voice of God. In light of the questions and challenges that young people are going through, we are invited to help them to discern the voice of God in a world of many voices. Help them to discern the voice of God. Two, we are invited to bring God's word to young people as their life compass. In many times in the book of Joshua, actually, God will come to Joshua time and again and remind him, do not be afraid, be of good courage. Joshua, remember that you will actually take my people to the promised land. God's word is always in front of Joshua in his leadership. And I wonder for us, in our time with our young people, is this the case? Or have we substituted the word of God for something more interesting? One of our churches I saw is starting a school of ministry. And I like the minister who said that yes, we want to reach out to the young people. But we will do so in a way that is faithful to the word of God. And to me this is a posture that we could take as a church. There are many questions that young people are navigating today. We have the issue that was proposed Yesterday, as I was listening to the proceedings, uh, pro the changes on the PP, one of those things, the sexual revolution, this LGBTIQA plus animal, again, which we do not have time to go for, for this is not a sexuality seminar, but I can come to talk about it at length with you. Answering the questions of Christianity, 
I speak with young people. I know of young people who have actually left the faith and they say that they are atheists. Can you imagine? My fathers and mothers in the faith. I will not worship God. There are some young people like that. And these young people raise interesting questions. They will tell us, you know, this thing was brought to us by the Wazungus. We don't worship. We already had our own way of worshiping God. How would we answer these questions, brothers and sisters? Would we say that they are disturbing us with their questions or will, will we provide them the time to discern God's word in light of the questions that they are asking? We think of the mental health issues and COVID here has affected us in great ways and there are a number of policy reports out there that can tell us more. But again, how do we bring God's word to give hope, to give purpose, to restore and replenish the joy of our people affected by some of these issues? This is God's word and it is good for us as our life compass. In fact, here in the passage, you will see that Joshua is going back to what God has done for them. Joshua 23 and Joshua 24, he gathers the people together and reminds them of the word of God. And that's why the Christian education department was remember, reminding us to remember, retrace, retell and do what? Rekindle. Bring God's word to them as the life compass. I am convinced, I am convinced that our solution is in the word of God for our young people. But we need to bring it to them in a way that we are answering their questions. During COVID, uh, people used to make a joke of the passage where Jesus tells the disciples that the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. And people were saying that the harvest is online but the laborers are <laughs> offline. <laughs> the harvest is online but the laborers are offline. Again, how are we going where young people are with the word of God? Because the word of God will never change. Number three, lesson two, engage young people. Come alongside young people to serve with them. To serve with them. I teach youth ministry at St. Paul's University. And I tell my students, this thing where we say the church, the young people are the church of tomorrow is not true. That, that the young people at the church of today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow. So we speak, when we talk about youth ministry, we engage young people. We don't do ministry to young people as if we have all the answers, but we do ministry to young people, but also with young people, with them. How else will they learn about our traditions? How, how else will they learn about the word of God? How else will they be able to preach? How will they be able to lead worship if we do not come alongside them and serve with them. Moses leads by example in many places. We find him, first of all, with Joshua, encouraging him, bringing him close to his pastoral visits, bringing him close as he is preaching, bringing him close as he goes to the hospital bed, bringing him close in the vestry, bringing him close to his office to discuss with him matters of life. When we think about young people, we would think of three approaches, which I, I say are short-sighted approaches. We could think of the hit-and-run approach. The hit-and-run approach is we say, there is this one activity that is coming in the year. We, let us mobilize ourselves and do this one thing. Alafu, pop, to end it. That is short-sighted and a reactive approach. Another approach is the entertainment-only approach. We think that what young people need are musical instruments and jokes and humor. We are thinking less of them. We do not think that they need the word of God just as we do need the word of God. Entertainment only approaches again, short-sighted and reactive. But then there is the us versus them. You know those young people. We have the old church where we used to meet. Now we have given them that church so that they can serve God and we will remain in there main service. <laughs> As if their service is here. Yeah? Short-sighted and reactive. I propose an intergenerational approach for youth ministry. We see this here in the life of Joshua and Moses. We will see it again in Ezra and Nehemiah. When the law is read, who are, um, pe who are the people among that congregation? They are people from all generations. How could we do this? 
you have for example valentine's past but it will come again and young people obviously they love the issues of love and all that call maybe three couples a couple who's been married one year couple who's been married eight years another couple that has been married for 30 years invite them to share their story with the young people that is an example of intergenerational ministry because i have learned in youth ministry some things are more caught than they are taught. Teaching is important, but so is modeling. The place of you, our elders, we really honor you and appreciate you. And Moses here is an example of an elder who is training Joshua. Grandfathers and grandmothers are a resource, ask Timothy. Older generations have value, experience, and wisdom that we are crying for them to share with us. I have heard the testimonies of younger ministers who say that we wish we would have people who would invest even more of their time with us. And that is the cry of the young people growing up in a fatherless generation, growing up in a parentless generation. Young people who are parented by YouTube and TikTok more than they are being parented by the people of faith. And here is a cry of a generation who will be there for us, who will teach us, who will mentor us, who will train us? I can hear the young people asking, and I see them as they wrestle with these issues we call drugs and alcoholism and sexuality. Some of them are searching for that affirmation that can come from God, but that can be transmitted through guardians of these young people. One warning, and then we conclude. There is something that is recorded in Judges 2.10 of the story of Joshua. We find these words, and all that generation, Joshua's generation, were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. The narrator also gives us the consequences of that kind of generational living without God, verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Another generation that serves the Baals. Now, you can see that this presents a challenge for us in our reading. You know, in leadership, we say that the success of a leader is based on successful transition. In fact, there are some scholars who say this. The mentor's accomplishments are evaluated through their mentees' success stories. The mentor's accomplishments are evaluated through their mentees' success stories. You want to know a leader? Look at what happens when they leave. In Africa, of course, they rarely leave. <laughs> well, were we to assess the leadership of Joshua, how would we rate him? How would we judge his leadership? What happened to his commitment to serve the Lord together with his household? Did he fail in transitioning the convictions to the next generations? Is Judges 2.10 a negative assessment of Joshua's leadership? Did he just focus on his household that he did not think about the generation? Whatever the case, the scriptures have told us that things went very wrong. And we can continue to think about that intergenerational faithfulness and ministry. But how do we make things right? I have proposed to us assisting young people to discern the voice of God, bringing God's word as a life compass to them. And the last C, come alongside to serve with young people. Here we find a warning. If we do not heed God's word, there will be trouble. I want to conclude by saying that I am happy and encouraged by what I see in the PCA church, many, many churches now are hiring children and youth workers. I mean, there, has, there have been some discussions in previous GAs and this, one's, this one about uh, our youth workers, and that is a good thing. Let us continue to invest more, more structured, more life-giving approaches to our youth in our congregations, bringing them close to us, creating safe spaces where they can ask questions rather than going to TikTok and in TikTok, there are very many pastors. 
pastors meaning those who are shepherding our young many very many far be it from us to be those who are silent when the world was shouting but far worse for us to be silent with that which can bring life to a new generation when the world is shouting with other false teachings brothers and sisters let us invest downwards because investing downwards is investing forward and it is investing heavenward will we limit god to work in our specific generations no 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 let us open our eyes and see this great opportunity to partner with god in what he has already promised to do i will be a god to you and to your children after you that is the promise of god we said yesterday that god is faithful we trust him more than trusting or looking at the challenges that our young people are going through this is the promise of god we join in the work that he's already doing the future of our church will be safeguarded if we take this posture and pattern of an intergenerational church serving honoring and valuing the different gifts that the different generations bring to the mission of God. With Joshua, I hope we will be able to say that me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who are you serving with? I hope that you are serving with young people. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Once again, dear Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful. We, we look at what is happening in our time. We look at what is happening in light of the different, in the generations, the next generations, Lord, our children and young people. And sometimes, Lord, we are fearful. We are afraid. Lord, we, we wonder, sometimes we are tempted to doubt whether you are still at work. Oh God, open our eyes to see your promise. For our eyes are not set on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Our eyes are not set on the things of this world, but our eyes are set on your word, which is truth and life to us. God, open our eyes as a church to see the great opportunities that we have with our children and young people and help us, Lord, to invest richly in them. As you, Lord, have laid down your life for your disciples, Lord, may we also lay down our lives for the next generations, Lord. Save us, Father, from an inward looking where we want to just grow structures without investing appropriately in the people in our buildings, in our congregations, and especially our young people, oh God. So Lord, renew our faith, renew our hope, uh, replenish our ideas, our creativity, so that Lord, we may see the opportunity at hand to bring your word to the next generations in a way that would help them, in a way that is relevant, in a way that answers their questions. Help us most loving God, so that your word would continue, Lord, to extend to every corner of this world as wide as the oceans cover the world. For this is your promise in Habakkuk. And Lord, we believe it and we trust it. For those, Lord, who come here with heavy hearts because they maybe have children or maybe have young people around them who seem hopeless and lost. Oh God, there is nothing that is too big for you. You are still the God who is on a mission to redeem and to restore, to heal. Lord, do it for them. Do it for them so that they may be able to testify that indeed you are the God of promise. You are the faithful God. You are the God who never leaves us. You are the God who understands us. And you are faithful to do this. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can do better than that in appreciating Dr. Kelvin. Once again, we must say that we are grateful to God for giving us Dr. Kelvin. Moderator, we will continue to be thankful to you that God led you to identify one of our young people to lead the General Assembly 
hii ni bible stand and as we continue to reflect on the big question of who we are serving with maybe how many other dr kevin murithis do we have in our various congregations that we may not have identified we are so grateful that St. Paul's University was able to see somebody in us and give him the role of being the head of department. Praise be to God. In 1998, I participated in the youth mission in Meru, where the young people constructed the Mekindori Nendeni area ministers' months. And immediately after that, led by our brother Wanangige, who passed on, during his burial at Muguga, the very Reverend Dr. George Wanjao gave us a story of how he visited one of our universities as a speaker. And when he was there, a Scottish minister standing a lot, singing, the youth were raising their hands and praying and crying and kneeling down, and very Reverend Dr. George Wanjao looked at them, and at one point he made a prayer to God. God, give me a spirit like that of those youth. And Dr. Wanjao said that his ministry was changed by seeing how the youth had passion and fire for the Lord, and he desired the spirit of young people and prayed, God, Mimi nataka roho kama huyo huyo ambaye ako na vijana jina la Bwana lisifiwe and we have seen how Dr Kevin is bringing it out strong very presbyterian very ordinary 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 and i know and i want to assure you that we have very many others in our churches let us you trust them praise be to god Bwana asifiwe we have come to the end of that very important session we will do uh, uh, him as we uh, recess tomorrow. I would want to ask, if possible, if we can begin like 10 minutes earlier. Moderator, I don't know whether it is possible when he is done, then we also can react as sometimes people react to the devotion and they can, we can ask ourselves what resolutions, even though informally, can we draw from the Bible study that has come to us during the General Assembly. So if we, tomorrow we can begin at uh, 10 minutes to 8, then we can have 10 minutes before the other session and maybe as the moderator and the Secretary General would guide us, we can ask ourselves as the General Assembly a question or two with the wisdom of the moderator. Bwana asifiwe. So nitaomba tusimame. We finish with the ones of grace and then we can have the young people in the assembly come and lead us with a aim as we prepare to come to the next uh, session. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And other the five in the assembly, please come forward and lead us in something as we prepare to come and continue with this assembly. Dr. Kevin, once again, as the 24th General Assembly, we are grateful we have an opportunity to say it officially tomorrow. Thank you.